Hey guys and welcome back to a new video. Have you ever asked yourself how you can actually be sure or make sure that a request being made to your server is coming from a genuine and trusted mobile device? Have you ever asked yourself what could really happen if an attacker could just manipulate the HTTP request being made to your backend? And maybe the term app attestation is not yet on your radar, but it's really all about preventing these types of critical security scenarios. Because without app attestation, what attackers can do is they can in the end unlock paid features in your app, they can inject spyware, they can pretty much make any type of request to your backend. They could, for example, cheat in video games, even in online games. So depending on what kind of app you're building, this is something you should take a look at. Because if we take a look at some real world use cases of app attestation and what can happen if you don't apply it, then typically what could happen, for example, is that there are some kind of mods for your app that maybe has premium features being unlocked via in-app purchases and an attacker could simply modify your app in a way to unlock these premium features for free. Or they could maybe also just manipulate the request to your backend that says, hey, grant premium features for this user. And while in-app purchases with Google billing or on the Apple side, of course, have some inbuilt security mechanisms and some cryptographic tokens that prevent some parts of that, there are still ways for attackers to abuse that. So for example, a modified app running on your device could intercept these payment tokens and use them for their own purposes. And while this scenario here with unlocking premium features for free is still something where you have reasonable options to validate something server-side, there are definitely also scenarios where you will hit the limitations of server-side validation. What, for example, if you have some kind of app where users can buy some concert tickets? Then depending on what kind of band this is selling for, there is usually some kind of limited stock for these tickets. And now what's happening quite often in the real world is that for popular bands, there are just some kinds of scripts or software that just automate buying up all those limited stock items to then resell these later on for a higher price. How would you want to detect something like this server site and validate that properly? Well, you could of course apply some sort of maybe IP rate limiting here. That also has its limitations because an attacker could just distribute these requests over multiple servers and in the end automate buying up all these limited stock items. Take the example of some kind of online game that you're playing on the mobile site. How do you want to be sure that the app, so an Android, the APK for example, isn't a modified one that maybe reinterprets the data the server sends to it. So if the server, for example, sends some kind of coordinates where all the enemies are, but the modified app in the end just reinterprets that data and says, no, all the enemies are now suddenly visible or are on a, all on that one map, which grants that local user an unfair advantage, then how do you want to validate that server side if someone is free to do whatever they want on the client side? Or how do you want to validate on the server side that a tap on the mobile device was a real tap from the user and not just some kind of simulated tap that was maybe made from a bot or so. Or if you have some kind of banking app, for example, how do you want to make sure that if a user and possibly even a genuine user who, who could log in with their uh, credentials to their banking app, how could you make sure that there is no other maybe malware or some other kind of app that is possibly spying on these credentials? And the good news is, there are ways to prevent that. And this overall process of preventing that is just called app attestation. So how does this actually work? Well, on the one hand, you could now think that you just uh, kind of hard code some kind of security checks inside of your app. But I can already say that doesn't do it because an attacker who owns your APK can pretty much do whatever they want with it. They can uh, reverse engineer it, they can repackage it, and they can therefore just change its behavior. So doing that is rather risky. Instead, what we can do is, on the mobile side, we can collect certain evidence about how trustworthy a device is. And we then take this evidence, package it together, sign it so that it's also cryptographically secure, that we can uh, clearly say on the server side, yes, that is real, real evidence. And this package of collected evidence is then sent to a third party service, which will cryptographically sign a token based on the evaluation of policies. This token is then returned to the client, which it can attach to requests being made to your server. And that is now where we also come to this video sponsor, which is GuardSquare, who've also sponsored quite some videos here. Great guys. They are the makers of ProGuard, which you've maybe worked with on Android. They're the makers of DexGuard, which you've maybe also seen my video about here, about uh, how reverse engineering really works and what we can do at least to make it quite hard for attackers to reverse engineer your app. And luckily, they also have a solution for app attestation. And I will show you exactly how this works with a practical example. So here we have some kind of a demo banking app where the user can enter their credentials. You can see here in my terminal, on the one hand, I have a local server running, which this app in the end will talk to. 
And if we just log in here, in my case with my credentials, Philip and Demo, and we then click login, you can see the request is being made and then we are logged into our bank account. Now what happens if this device that this app is running on is actually not a real trusted environment? So for example, as I mentioned, what if malware is installed on this device that could possibly spy on these credentials? And this is what I will show you right now. So here I will minimize the app and I will actually install a little malware app on this emulator. You can see, there we go. If we now open the app, then this app actually implements two types of attack angles on the one hand via an accessibility service. So an accessibility service is in the end used for exactly what the term says in order to help and aid with accessibility. So it may be able to read out loud certain texts on any app that is open. It may be able to input certain texts inside of text fields. It may even be able to uh, simulate taps on the device. And that of course, not just for the app, the accessibility service is coming from, but the purpose is to help uh, across the device with that. And this can of course be abused by such malware apps if the service could simply spy on the values of certain text fields like our credentials. So if we click on accessibility settings here, that's also how, because this is such a uh, service that can potentially cause harm, we need to explicitly turn this on, but not every user is very technical. So some people ju would just uh, blindly confirm this, but if we say allow here and then go back and now say, okay, I will actually also turn on these overlay settings, which I'll say something about in a moment, but that's a separate thing. So malware sample here also, and then say attack simulation. And we say we have a non-touchable overlay. This is what the accessibility service brings us here or um, creates. And if we, if we now click simulate attack, so the accessibility service in the end now creates a non-touchable overlay that can spy on this data that we enter here. You can see there it is. It's of course now visible, but if we now click log in, then we get forbidden. So our banking app has properly detected that there is an accessibility service running and this makes this environment here potentially untrusted. So the server rather says, no, that login request I won't approve. So for the attacker, all they see is forbidden. You are not allowed to do this. And that's all the information they get. So suddenly the login does not work anymore, even though we've used the same credentials. Another type of attack that would be reasonable here is so-called activity injection. So this is in the end what would try to put an overlay over your banking app that looks identical to it, but obviously is not your real banking app and then hope that users enter their real credentials there so you could spy on these. If we simulate the attack here and uh, have the non-touchable overlay being off, then after the count on ticks here, we will see uh, such an overlay. This won't look exactly like the banking app here as this is just a demo, but uh, you can see this could be your banking app where you then uh, say, okay, I enter my credentials here, even though it's not your banking app. And that is also what app attestation and specifically the SDK from Guardsburg can detect. But again, this is just one example of a banking app. As, as I mentioned, there are so many different scenarios where you just want to be sure that if a request comes from a client, it's genuine and it's coming from a trustworthy environment. So how does this work on the technical side? On the one hand, the SDK will just perform some routine checks that the APK hasn't been tampered with. It will verify the runtime code integrity. It will verify the device integrity. So for example, if the bootloader is unlocked, if SE Linux is enforced. So with these checks, it can, for example, also detect if your app is running on a rooted device. And all these pieces of evidence, for example, hey, rooted device, hey, this app is running on an emulator. Hey, this is actually an app that has been tampered with. It's not the original app from Google Play. And all these pieces of evidence will then be packaged together by the SDK and sent to GuardSquare's server. And the server then responds with a signed verdict. This signed verdict that is then returned to your client is intentionally structured in a way that the client can't interpret this in any way. So the client doesn't know whether this is a good or a bad verdict, because if they would be able to know that, then they could simply learn from the responses that your server gives. Okay, what I just did was good. What I then did wasn't that good. And then adjust their attack in one direction that is more beneficial for the attacker. The only way for them actually to know about what the verdict means is to send it to your server, and this would then reveal themselves. And with this kind of system in place, what you in the end cover here are three different scenarios that you are interested in when having such, a, um, such an app that where well, you definitely want to have a, a decent security setup. And that is on the one hand that the app is used by a real attacker. So a real attacker gets their hands on your APK, they maybe tamper with it, they change the source code, repackage it, and then make some faked or some, some manipulated requests to your server. Then we have a second scenario, which is also the one that I showed you with the banking app here, that the app is simply running on a device from a trusted user. This guy, this, whoever this account belongs to, may be a normal customer from the bank, but the device may have malware running on it. 
That's also something you want to find out about. And scenario number three is you want to find out when the app that you have is running at least on a suspicious device. So for example, if it's running on a rooted device, then this is not harmful by default, but it already tells you, okay, there is at least a user who knows what routing is, how that works and what they can do with that. So you rather want to be careful with these types of devices. And again, not necessarily because you think that the user of that rooted device is harmful, but maybe also because there may be malware running on that device. And if malware is running on a rooted device, that malware, of course, has way more potential to cause harm than on a normal device. It's also important to say that GuardSquare's SDK here doesn't just focus on isolated true and false values. So for example, hey, is there an emulator file present? Yes, okay, immediately block. That's not the case. Instead, they actually, of course, don't have their SDK being just installed on possibly your device, but on thousands of other devices, they can then learn from, collect all that collective evidence, which therefore helps to also spot new attack patterns pretty much instantly. So for example, also if they detect some kind of compromised certificate that some kind of app was signed with, they add it to their certificate revocation list and that change to not trust apps from that certificate will be applied immediately. There are some other cases that do need to ship an update. So for example, if you have some kind of changes in your detection logic, but their vision is really to go as far as they can to use that data they have to detect possibly new attack methods or angles. And what you can then see here on the server console that I haven't shown you yet, here this was the first request that I made that was successful. So we get, got some cryptographic token that is then used for the validation to check if the uh, evidence collected on the client side is really uh, also true evidence. Here are some token checks. A policy actually triggered because uh, it was an unsafe environment because in the end we were running this on an emulator. But in this case, this was still tolerated as you, as you saw. So making a note in the log and proceeding. So we still allowed that call, but we already made a log. Okay, maybe be a bit careful there since someone is using your app on an emulator. And that's all something you can then adjust in the web console. Uh, how fine-grained you actually want these checks to be, what to permit, what rather not to permit. But if you take a look at the second request here where I tried to log in with the malware being installed, here another policy fired, which shows no malware detected on the device. And this policy was enough to say, no, we don't grant that login request. And this is then how this would look like in their app attestation console here on the web, where you then really see in real time which policies you've set for this app have been triggered on which kind of device. And these policies, as we've seen, could be, hey, unsafe environment, maybe rooted emulator, uh, malware is detected, the app has maybe been tampered with, and all these triggers you can then see here on their web console in real time. And you have some tabs here where you can really inspect this. You can see applications running on the emulator. You see all that details, which Android version, which device model. You can then also click on that to get some more information. So you really get all these details, the IP address, the app version, and what specific threat was detected. In our app settings here on this console, you can then also see the policies that you've set and that you can also turn on here. So in our case, we have uh, four policies that are enabled, app tempering, so if the, if the uh, code or the APK has been changed in some way and repackaged, unsafe environment here, so uh, probably an, an emulator or some kind of rooted device that would be detected, malware abuse, modified or repackaged app. Okay, so that would be the repackaged app, but app tempering could also be that um, some kind of other tools are maybe being injected. I, I've also shown you that in the uh, video about reverse engineering, there was a tool called Frida that in the end let us inject certain code, change certain function calls to maybe print some secrets or so. And if we also go on this pen here, then we can see what this does in detail. So by this policy, unexpected libraries or hooking frameworks uh, are detected. So that would be what Frida is, for example, about. Tampering with the binary, so that would uh, like, like to be the um, repackaging the actual APK. Changing the APK signature, so if an attacker really repackages your, your app, but with a different signing key, since ideally only you should, you should have your signing key of the APK, that would be detected. Function hooks, code tracing, and you can really adjust that here in a, in a very fine-grained way. And then just say, hey, these are the policies that I want to have for my app, and you can really turn these on or off in real time, and that will be applied to every single app where this SDK is running on. What is also really interesting here in this console is this key section, because with this, we can really understand how this overall encryption and signature process works. So we can on the one hand see a public key, which is the signature check key and an encryption key. And whenever there is some kind of public key here, that means there also needs to be some kind of private half living somewhere else. In the case of the signature check key, the private half of this key here lives on the server from guard square. And the moment they issue the token, they will sign it with their private key living on GuardSquare server. 
and your server can then verify that token signature by using the signature check key, in this case, the public one. Furthermore, the actual payload of that token, so what kind of data is attached there, will additionally be encrypted. And for that, this encryption key is used here. So when the GuardSquare server builds the token, it will encrypt the payload. So possible policy triggers, timestamps, and so on. It will encrypt all that with this public key. And the private half, the private key of this encryption key, will then live on your server, which is able to decrypt that token's payload in order to know, okay, oh, this, this was the policy that triggered here. Let's better not grant access. And maybe when hearing about this and you maybe were already a little bit familiar with the topic of app attestation, what you've stumbled over was Google Play Integrity because Google also has a comparable SDK that also helps you to verify the integrity of a mobile device. However, comparing it with GuardSquare's solution has clear downsides because on the one hand, Google Play Integrity relies on the device having Google Play services installed. And simply not all Android devices have Google Play services installed. And if an attacker now knows that, they could of course just make the attack from a device that does not have Google Play services. On the other hand, GuardSquare's app attestation uh, solution really runs on a much wider range of devices. Also with Google Play Integrity, uh, they in the end only give you a solution for Android. And since companies typically have Android and iOS app, you typically also want this app attestation solution here for both sides. On the Apple side, you would therefore need a different SDK than on Android, increases the complexity of the product. Here, you really have both in one SDK. Play Integrity also doesn't work with these kinds of policies where you can say, hey, this is actually what I allow for my app. This is what I don't want to allow. They don't give you really clear reasons on why a certain integrity check failed. And then obviously also not which policy failed because they don't work with policies. And when it is about root detection, then Google Play thinks that the only thing to look at is whether the bootloader of your Android device has been unlocked. So while both Google Play Integrity and GuardSquare's SDK here are looking for signs whether the device is rooted, where they completely differ is what happens after root has been obtained. So while Google Play Integrity really just stops at detecting root, where an attacker after having gained root can really just freely, for example, alter your app in memory, they could inject code, they could patch it, they could uh, inspect it in, in a lot of detail. GuardSquare's solution in contrast kind of keeps on fighting back after the root has been obtained. And it does so by simply adding some extra layers into your app that, for example, make the code very hard to change or examine in memory. It, uh, it possibly even encrypts certain parts in RAM of your app. So Google has a more, a more optimistic way on this, which is bad in this context, where they say, okay, if we simply protect the bootloader here, then the app is safe. GuardSquare, on the other hand, is much more careful with this topic, where they say, okay, anyone may be able to actually bypass those root restrictions and gain root in another way. For example, by making use of a known or unknown security vulnerability, which could then grant root without unlocking the bootloader. So what GuardScore does is they just build additional defenses around your app, even if root has already been obtained. So is this something that every single app out there should implement? No, probably not. But if you have an app that talks to some kind of backend and you want to be sure that requests being made to that backend are always coming from a genuine and trusted device, no matter what kind of purpose your app has. I, I went over some examples here. So if you have a video game, if you have some kind of app that where users can unlock paid features, if you have some kind of store where you, some automation could really buy up these limited stock items, if you have a banking app, some kind of apps where, where, where security really matters, then this is something you should take a look at. Because as I usually say, most people start to think of security when it's too late. So if you say, hey, this would be something that we could actually use at our company, that I could maybe, uh, that, that could be of value in my app because I really don't want attackers to, to do whatever they want with my app. Then take a look at this SDK here. A uh, link is down in this video's description. You can of course take a closer look there at what it's really all about. I think I gave you uh, quite a little demo here of what you can expect. And other than that, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was also educational. And then I will see you back in the next video. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye-bye. <laughs>